seeing each other in person. I guess this is next best thing. I love, 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 love when I can see your faces. That resulted in zero people showing their faces. Well, I miss you and I hope that I could see your faces. But it's just real. It's it's, it's real and it's nice. It's, like, it's weird for me to talk to this this thing that's on my desk. Oh, nice, nice, nice to see you, Timothy. Uh, it's weird for me. Uh, hi, Angela. Uh, hi, Ariel. Um, so yeah, hey, Makar. Hey, <laughs> streaming CTR LA is having a party. <laughs> Would have never guessed it was Fareed and Abram. Anyways, um, and thank you guys all for joining tonight. Um, so like Danny just um, said, um, happy month of Kiak. Um, we will be discussing, in these four weeks of Kiak, we will be discussing uh, four different characters. Uh, the first character that was chosen for tonight is Zachariah the Priest, or also known as Zacharias. Those names are interchangeable. Um, when Danny asked me to give a talk about Zechariah, I was like, there is nothing to talk about. There is really nothing to talk about. He will tell you this. I said this. There's nothing to talk about. There's one story of him in the Bible, and I don't really know <laughs> what to talk about. It really doesn't even talk about him. The guy did something wrong, and he was punished. Like, what are we going to talk about? His punishment it makes no sense. Well, that's because I was not as familiar with him then as I am now. So thankfully, I had the opportunity to uh, dig deep and uh, discover for myself um, just how amazing, actually, uh, Zechariah himself was. And I hope that we can just gain a little tidbit uh, about his life. So what do we know about Zechariah the priest? This is a, an opportunity for you guys to unmute. I don't know if you have that ability. Unmute and tell me everything you know about Zechariah the priest, or just one thing, so you can don't. Don't take everything because there's not that many things. <laughs> he didn't believe the angel when he's when they told him he was gonna have a kid. Oh, this guy's just going straight, straight into it, straight into it. I was expecting someone to say like, "Oh, his name starts with Z." Oh, he was a priest. <laughs> okay, yeah, Mina just went straight in. Good, good. Mina got to the point. Well, what else do we know about Zachariah the priest? Basic. Basic things. We don't know much, so anything you say is good. He was a priest. He was a priest. Good. What else do we know? Who was his wife? This is tough, huh? Elizabeth. Elizabeth, Elizabeth was his wife. And who was his son? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Come on, guys. What's going on? <laughs> that that So that's pretty much all I knew about Zechariah the priest um, prior to this. So um, so because he was a priest, we know that um, he was, obviously, he was Jewish. Um, he was a descendant of Aaron, and he was a direct descendant of Aaron. As you know, Aaron was the brother of Moses, and he was a priest. And every descendant of Aaron was a priest, every single one of them. So in the beginning, that wasn't that many people. It was Aaron and his sons and then his grandsons, and that's it. But over time, to the point where it got to the time of Zechariah, there were as many as 20,000 priests. So there were just so many priests, like way more than they actually needed. But that was the rule. So Zechariah was a priest just by the virtue of the fact that he was born as a direct descendant of Aaron. Uh, so because there were so many priests, they needed a way to organize them. So they divided them into 24 what they call divisions. There are 24 divisions. So there were more or less about a thousand priests in each division. Uh, and he belonged to the specific division of Abijah. Abijah. And we're going we're gonna to jump into that a little bit later. But he belonged to the division of Abijah. So there were only three times in the whole year when all of the priests would participate. It was the, the Passover, 
the Pentecost, there is a feast of the Pentecost in the Jewish tradition, and the Feast of the Tabernacles. These were the three most important feasts that they had, and these were the only times when all the priests served. It was kind of like their big days, like our Holy Week and things like that. So each division, remember there are 24 divisions, each division used to serve two weeks out of the year. Two weeks out of the year. And each week was one priest. So each division had two priests serving per year. Two priests per year. Now we said that there were about a thousand priests in each division. So that means that even if you lived to be like a hundred years old, only two priests per year, that means that throughout your entire life, there would be 200 priests chosen. And we said there's a thousand priests in each division. So 800 of those priests were never chosen. So most of the priests, like 80, 90% of them, never even served. So what they used to do, because it was obviously a big blessing and a lot of the priests wanted to serve, is they used to cast lots. So when the lot was cast, it was basically like a way to determine uh, who would be chosen. That was the greatest day of that priest's life. It's literally as if he won the lottery. Because this was the day that, he, the day that he's been dreaming of since he was a kid. Since he was a kid, he knew that he would become a priest. But it was never guaranteed to him that he would be able to serve. And once he was chosen, he was never able to serve again. So it was kind of like this was your moment. That's it. You got it. Enjoy it. So in this particular day, uh, the lot fell on Zacharias the priest. And if you were like any other priest in that day, you would be thrilled beyond belief. And this was literally the greatest day of your life. Please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, verse 5. I need someone to read for us uh, verses 5 through 7. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Please, anybody can read. I can read it. All right, go ahead. Sure. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the division of Abijah. His wife was the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they are both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they both will well advanced in years. Thank you. All right. We already introduced uh, Zechariah. We introduced the, the this concept of the divisions of the priests. His wife was also a descendant of Aaron, and it was considered like extra credit like bonus brownie points if you also married a wife who was in the same kind of d descendant of Aaron so he was like a priest and his wife was of the same lineage and so they were super hardcore Jewish people very religious and loved God as it says here in verse 6 now verse 7 sounds just like a whatever verse but it's actually extremely important Be but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. What the Bible is telling us here is that halas, it was over for them. There was no chance that they were going to have kids, because if you understand the physiological uh, cycle of reproduction, you know that it's game over. Once a woman is past menopause, she cannot reproduce. It's, it's not possible. It's not going to happen. Um, now, why is this so important? Why is this so important? Well, at that time, the Jewish rabbis had created a list of seven types of people who were excommunicated from God. These are people that they say that God really, really looked down upon. Number one was a Jew who has no wife, meaning a man who didn't get married. And number two in the same line was a Jew who had a wife but had no child. So. You were excommunicated from God. Basically, you were unblessed if you were you chose not to get married, you had no wife, or you got married and then you had no child. At that time, I'm sure they didn't know 
the concept of infertility and what was going on with all of that. So they were just like hardcore, like you didn't have a child, like you're excommunicated from God. So now you walk around and everybody knows that you were excommunicated from God. Basically, God doesn't like you. Of course, this is not true, but this is the Jew, the Jewish religion and the Jewish is very eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, black and white. You didn't have a child, there's something wrong with you. And these people were righteous people, as it says, and they were both walking with God in all his commandments. And they were blameless, like these people were literally perfect. And this one thing that was out of control was like a, out of their control was like a stain on their life. Something that they walked around with and they carried in their hearts and their minds everywhere that they went. So now, so now you can only imagine that when Zechariah the priest was chosen and the lot was, the lot fell upon him to be the priest for this one week. What do you think he's praying for? What do you think he's asking God for more than anything else? Yes, he's asking for a child, but Zachariah is no dummy. He knows that he's old, his wife's old, and the chances of them having a child are not slim, they're, they're zero. He's, it's that, that's already past him, and this is just something that he's going to have to live with. Uh, so let's continue reading uh, verses 8 to 18. We need somebody to read for us, please. Luke chapter 1, 8 to 18. I got it, Kiko. Um, so it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zachari Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Keep going? Yeah, till 18, please. Oh, okay. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. Thank you. Verse 18 is, is a very famous verse. This is the line in Zacharias' life, which shall live in infamy. If there was one thing he could take back in his entire life, it was probably this one comment. He questioned Archangel Gabriel and revealed that he didn't think it was possible. Uh, obviously, we said he was a very righteous man. He was a very good guy. And being that he was a priest, we can assume that he was very well versed in the Old Testament. Did he forget what happened to Abraham and Sarah? I mean, that's pretty famous. Literally, Abraham is the father of all the... I'm sure he knows that story. But he wanted some proof. He wanted proof from God that this was going to happen. You know what this is like? This is like when you take out hundreds of thousands of, of student loans, right? And they make you some, sign something, this very scary uh, form, this very scary contract. It's called a master promissory note. Like, it's so scary. And if you've ever signed it, those words are probably, you probably have PTSD after me mentioning that. This master promissory note is basically you literally signing your life away, saying, I promise that even if I die, even listen to how crazy this, even if I die, my family is going to pay this debt. They want a promise for you and they want to put your life on the line to make sure that they get their money. So Zachariah wanted kind of the same thing. He wanted from God 
amass the promissory note. He wanted from God this promise that, hey, man, uh, this nice that you're going to give me a child, what your angel saying, just give me some proof. I just need a promissory note kid, that says, you will have a child, you will have a son, his name will be John, and I can walk around and be like, look what happened to me. I got it. I got it here in my hand. Of course, this is not how God operates. And literally an angel appeared to him the angel, while he was in the altar, the holiest of holies, and he asked for proof. Let's continue reading uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 19 through 25. If someone could read those for us, please. Sure, I can read it. Yeah, don't all jump at once, guys. <laughs> I got it. Uh, and the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. How long? How, where do you want me to go? Uh, verse 25. Sorry. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was as soon as the days of his service were completed that he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Thank you for reading that. So here we see Zacharias's punishment, the punishment from the angel in verse 20. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. Now, this is a pretty harsh punishment, if you ask me, in my opinion. Um, we know that St. Mary, St. Mary had the same question. She said, how can this be since I do not know a man? And was this punishment given to her? No, it wasn't. Why was this punishment given to Zechariah? Well, that's not the focus of our question, but some uh, people say that because Zechariah and the elevated rank that he had he should have known better, and he should have known better than to question God. Whereas Mary was literally a young girl who was not a priest. She was not any rank in the church, and she was asking out of her own innocence. Um, either way, many people look at this becoming mute as a punishment. However, the more that I looked into it, I realized that this muteness is actually not a punishment, but it's actually a blessing. And then the more that I read about it, I realized, wait, isn't silence a virtue? Why are we calling this a punishment? It's like, imagine if someone punished you with love, like you have to love. Well, it's like, that's not a bad thing. Like love is a good thing. Why are you punishing me by giving me love and saying that I have to love? So isn't this something that we could strive for? Yes, there is such a, something called the virtue of silence or the gift of silence. And this is what I want to take from Zacharias's life, because there are two types of being mute. There is uh, the mute as a punishment, but then there is a holy type of silence and stillness, which I want us to uh, think about today. So the first question that we ask ourselves is silence necessary? Is silence necessary? Uh, now, the most famous saint who reflected on this virtue of silence was Saint Arsenius. He was uh, a monk who lived in the third century, um, who was very famous for his quotes about silence and also ironically his quotes about silence and by practicing silence. He says, this is his most famous line, I have often repented of speaking but never of remaining silent. So what triggered this desire for this virtue uh, in Saint Arsenius? Like it is said that Saint Arsenius used to walk around with a stone in his mouth so that whenever he had the urge to speak, he would, his tongue would be caught in this stone and he would remember that he needed to be silent. Now, did he just wake up one day and say like, I'm going to be silent? How did he even know that silence was a good thing? Um, well, one day he was praying in solitude and he was asking God to reveal his will for him. 
And he heard a voice saying to him, Arsenius, flee, be silent, and pray always, for these are the source of sinlessness. Three things, flee, be silent, and pray always, for these are the source of sinlessness. The source of sinlessness? I've never heard of anything being called the source of sinlessness. If someone were to ask you, what are the top three sources of sinlessness? Top three. Would any of you say silence? I know I wouldn't. I would say like, if you want to be sinless, like make sure that you love God and you, you love your neighbor as yourself. Like that's how you be sinless. If you, if you fulfill those commandments perfectly, then you will be sinless. But this, this voice that he heard said, flee, be silent, and pray always. Three things. If we pay close attention to this command given to St. Arsenius, we recognize that it's based on the familiar words of the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, which says, But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father, who is in the secret place. What are those three things, the source of sinlessness? Flee, be silent, pray always. What does it say in the Sermon on the Mount? But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. Literally, literally, that voice that he heard was, in other words, the same words that Christ used on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Father Thomas Hopko of Blessed Memory, he's a very famous uh, priest. Uh, he used to be the uh, dean um, of the uh, St. Vladimir's, St. Vladimir's uh, Seminary, one of the modern day saints, in my opinion, uh, wrote many good books. And he said something which uh, is amazing. He said, in order to pray, you've got to be quiet. In order to get to know your children, you've got to be quiet. In order to get to know your spouse, you've got to be quiet. In order to get to know yourself, you've got to be quiet. And in order to get to know God, you've got to be quiet. Can you imagine what would happen if you were looking for a spouse and you went on this date and this first date where everybody's nervous on this first date. And the goal of this first date is to just kind of get to know each other. Like, I want to get to know you. You want to get to know me. If you went on this first date and all that person did was just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and kept talking about themselves the entire time. You guys are sitting at dinner for two hours and all this person do is talk. You couldn't get a word in. Did that person learn anything about you? No. If you want to get to know God and all you do is talk and talk and talk and talk, not prayer, I mean like talk to your friends and, your, and you fill your life with noise, do you ever get to listen to hear what God is saying to you? You're, all you're doing is talking. Like, get this noise out of your life. Stop making noise. If you want to know God, you have to be quiet. How do we know that God talks to us in the quiet? Well, in the Old Testament, we see that silence became a medium for divine revelation. This is how God revealed himself to other people. In 1 Kings chapter 19, we read about a time when Elijah the prophet was scared. He had just defeated 450 priests of Baal on Mount Carmel, absolutely destroyed them. They, they were all executed, 450 of them, because his one God was able to do what all of these priests and the Baal, they could not do. Then word got to the queen, Jezebel the queen, that Elijah the prophet, this guy, destroyed 450 of the priests of the god, Baal, who you believe in. And this woman was crazy. This woman was absolutely insane. She said, basically, I'm going to do to myself if I don't do to you what you did to those prophets. Basically, she's going to kill herself if she doesn't kill him first. When someone says that to you, I'm going to kill myself if I don't kill you. You better be scared because that person is not trying to kill themselves. So he was dying. He, he was literally scared out of his mind. This man who just defeated 450 priests with the help of the Almighty God was scared of this one. Not, not, I'm not saying that the woman, he was scared of her, okay? So what did he do? He ran away. He ran away and he hid in a cave, right? He ran as far as he could because... He, he, he knew that she was, she was out to get him. 
And while he was in this cave, he fell asleep. And when he woke up in the morning, he heard the voice of the Lord saying to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to kill my life. He's telling God, I'm scared. I am scared. I have been a very good person, but the children of Israel have been very bad. They've forsaken your covenant, destroyed your altars, and killed the prophets, and now they're trying to kill me. So what did God tell him? This is in verse 11, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. Then God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still, small voice. In other translations, instead of still small voice it says the shout the sound of sheer silence sheer si have you ever heard silence before this sounds like a dumb question have you ever heard silence like if you were very very quiet right now in your homes just three seconds does it sound silent it doesn't sound silent in my home i mean i have two kids but I, it doesn't sound silent in my home it's very hard to actually hear Silence. You probably hear it if you've ever gone into the middle of the desert at night when nothing is going on or gone camping, Yosemite, one of those places in the middle of nowhere. That's where you can really hear the silence. That's how it sounded like. Now, does it make sense that it was in the sheer silence that he was able to hear God? Yes, this is how God wanted to reveal to Elijah his presence and his purpose. Now, what about Jesus? In the Gospel of St. Mark, we read how Jesus spent a typical day. He entered the town. He taught in the synagogue. He restored the health to a man with an unclean spirit. He went to Simon's house where he healed Peter's mother-in-law. And in the evening, he ministered to the sick, the sick of the city. Okay, all of this was just one day. Where did Jesus get the strength to do all of this activity? Well, St. Mark tells us right away. He tells us the answer. It says, the next morning, a great while before the day, Jesus arose and went out to a lonely place, and there he prayed. Even Jesus did this. Before his crucifixion, he poured out his soul in prayer in the garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. He emerged from Gethsemane, ready for the cross. The night before he chose his own disciples, he went out on the mountainside, and it says, he passed the whole night offering prayer to God. So now, if Jesus, Jesus, God, found it necessary to carve out for himself time for quiet, silence, and reflection, if he had to do this for his own soul, to keep his soul focused on prayer at all times, what about us? What about us? We have to do it for our health, not just because this is a, an exercise or an activity or something that's like a, a good suggestion. No, this is something that is absolutely necessary. If Jesus found it necessary, then guess what? We do and we should too. When we go into our closet or into our room, as it says in Matthew chapter 6, and we shut the door, God has an opportunity to become real to us. He has an opportunity to reveal himself to us. So... As it says in the psalm, as, as King David, the prophet, also discovered in Psalm 46, verse 10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. All the holy people in the world discovered this, that in order to know God, you have to be still. You have to be quiet. You have to be silent. There is a famous uh, French mathematician, which you probably heard of, named Blaise Pascal. Now, I, don't, I remember, recognized his name, but I didn't remember much about him. And then I looked him up, and this guy invented like a million things. Smart dude, also happened to be a Catholic theologian. What did he say? He said, all human unhappiness comes from not knowing how to stay quietly in a room. Now, if you know me, I love two kinds of 
uh, sayings. I love all sayings and I love never sayings because that means that there's no exceptions. I hate gray area. There's no exceptions. What does he say? All human unhappiness, all, all of it, all of it comes from not knowing how to stay quietly in a room. Now, okay, surely if this guy who's a mathematician, smart dude, discovered this, what about us? This guy's just repeating and uh, basically reflecting what the church is already teaching us. There is a concept known as Hezekiah. Hezekiah. Has everyone ever heard that term? Just raise your hand. Nobody. Oh, okay. Angela heard it. Hezekiah. Hezekiah means stillness, rest, quiet, and silence. This is a virtue. This is a virtue that we all should try to attain. Specifically, more specifically, it is withdrawal from the external world with a focus on your inward stillness, contemplation, and prayer. This concept was so special for the saints that St. Saint John Climacus said that Hezekiah is paradise restored, heaven and our hearts. Do you ever sit back and just think, how amazing the Garden of Eden was. I always I, I always do this. I don't know why I do this, but I always think, because I always think like, if those two people just hadn't messed up, we would be in paradise. Like, it just like makes me angry. Like, this one, this one thing. But then like, of course, I commit a million sins every day and I probably would have done the same thing and worse, I would have eaten, the, I would have eaten the whole tree. There would have been no fruits left. It would have been a disaster. So thankfully I wasn't in their position. But think about how amazing it was. Think about it. You wake up, you walk and talk with God. You eat some fruit. You swim in the river. We know there were many rivers. Like you literally get to go swimming and eat fruit like and play with animals. Literally, it was paradise. Like when you think of paradise, that's what you think of. If you want to restore that paradise in your life today, St. John Climacus says you got to pursue Hezekiah. Stillness and silence. What is the opposite of Hezekiah? What is the opposite of it? What should you not be doing? Constant noise. Constant noise. You know, the constant noise. Who would want that? Like, I don't even have constant noise. Like, what is he even saying? Constant noise. Who would want that? Great question. In the 1920s, the radio was popularized around the world. And people put these little devices, these boxes in their homes. Actually, they were quite big. Big boxes in their homes so that they can have the radio, so they can have the news, they can have music, they can have some sort of connection. That's what we're, because apparently their world was too boring. Shortly afterwards, we got TVs, and everyone put these big box TVs in the houses, black and white, then came color. And then it was like, well, at least you could go outside, you could take a walk, you can enjoy some fresh air. Well, thank you to Sony, in 1979, they invented something called the Walkman. Who remembers the Walkman? If you're as old as me, you remember the Walkman. They called it a Walkman. Literally, they should have called it the Paradise Destroyer. Like, this is how you do it if you want to ruin your life. The Walkman. Because why would you go outside and take a walk and enjoy just quietness and God's nature? And why would you do that? You need to fill your ears and your stuff with constant noise and music and... Maybe you're listening to something nice. Maybe you're listening to an audio book or a sermon. or Maybe you're listening to something nice. But the point is there's always noise. It's never quiet. Even when you're listening to white noise, it's noise. It's not quiet. And now, I'm not judging any parents who do this, but some parents literally have to put their kids by, by putting noise in their room so that their kids can sleep. Like, think about that. Your kid needs to go to sleep with quiet. So you're putting noise in the room? You know why you have to put noise in the room? To block out all the other noise out what are we doing? What are we doing? This is craziness. Like, I have to put noise to block out the no Like, it gives me a headache. There's noise in my head just thinking about it. Well, after that, thanks to Steve Jobs and Apple, our lives got a lot better. <laughs> better or worse? We got the iPod, then we got the iPhone, and literally you could have... I if you remember, if you've never seen uh, the Steve Jobs introduction of the iPod, you need to go on YouTube and you need to watch it because it was literally revolutionary. He had like, uh, yeah, I haven't watched it in a while, but he had like all these tapes and CDs and like all of this audio filling like this whole shelf. He's like, you could have it just right here. 
in your pocket like it was revolutionary and now we don't even think about it like we all have these phones and literally they're this big they fit in our pockets they fit in our purses whatever and we have hundreds of thousands if not millions of hours in our hands at any time whenever i'm feeling quiet whenever i'm feeling still whenever i'm feeling hezekiah i could ruin it i could do it i have the power to do it right here this is the answer if you want to ruin your life right not just ruining your life with audio of course we're focusing on that but of course we do a lot of million other things with our phones and they're so distracting and even when you're when i'm here i'm getting texts i'm getting messages things are popping up notifications it's just ruining my life this is how you disturb your peace this is how this is how you defeat hezekiah this is the opposite of hezekiah what is the purpose we said is it important we saw that it's important it's necessary well what is the purpose of it the purpose of hezekiah is to celebrate the liturgy in our hearts. There are three types of ways that we can celebrate the liturgy. There is the liturgy of the heart. There is the liturgy of the people, which we celebrate all together in the church. And then there is the liturgy after the liturgy, which is serving Christ in the world and fulfilling the commandment, which was, I was hungry and you fed me. If you want to celebrate the liturgy in your heart, this liturgy which Christ, this mini liturgy which Christ spoke about in Matthew 6, 6, it starts with solitude. That is the purpose of it. Saint Simeon said of Moses that Moses went on the mountain as a mere man. And he came down carrying God with him in the form of the Ten Commandments. Saint Anthony went into the desert as a mere man and he came out of it carrying God. It was there that he met God in the wilderness. So if we can descend daily with our minds into our hearts and stand in God's presence, this is the fruit of our solitude. To carry God with us into the world, just as these saints carried God to us. Isn't it our uh, command that Christ gave us that we should go and preach the gospel to all nations? How do we do that? Of course, you can go and you can stand on the side of the road or you can be a mini Christ, a mini walking Christ, carrying Christ in your heart to all people. And the way that you foster this, the way that you build this up, the way that you grow this is by focusing on your solitude and focusing on your prayer. And that's where you see your personal growth so that when you go out, you can share this fruit with other people. The whole purpose of our lives, of our spiritual lives, is to meet Christ. And we see that in, in Luke chapter 17, verse 21, it says, the kingdom of God is within you. Some Someone said, and this is a very nice quote, that the heart, our heart is the Lord's reception room. This is where we go to meet him. So if we want to meet Christ, we don't need to go to the church to meet Christ. This is especially valuable during the time of the pandemic and uh, quarantine and stay at home order whatever of course we would love to go to church to meet with christ and to celebrate the liturgy with christ but you can meet christ every single day at any time of the day in your heart but it begins and it ends solitude so i ask that we all can can pray that we may grow in our silence grow in our solitude grow in our uh focusing on God and God alone so that we can achieve and grow in this virtue of Hezekiah and glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Thank you guys for having me tonight. It was a blessing for me. I love you all and I miss you. Um, if you have any questions or comments or anything, go ahead.